Um, I've got a bit, gone a bit young adult here, I'm afraid, um, which is not something I normally do. It's called, it's called What I Know. I am an ordinary boy. This is not like the films, though I suppose that is what people say in the films. This is not an explanation. An explanation. It stopped being important where they came from and what they want. As far as I know, there is no longer anyone working on trying to solve that mystery. No rebel alliance, no underground bunker. So if you're reading this with hope of an explanation, you'll be disappointed, like me. I am not the boy who will save the world from them. I am not brave or resourceful. I pissed my pants when I saw Michelle with Alice's heart in her fist. You should know that none of this will give me a deeper understanding of my relationship with my family, because it is very unlikely that I will ever talk directly to them again. There will not be a training montage in which an old man teaches me how to kill them, because he can't kill them. I will not meet a girl who is not traditionally pretty, but who has a strong nose and dark hair and a French accent. She will not say, oh you see, before speaking perfect English. We will, not, we will not have sex on my mattress in the bathroom, the only door with a lock, and this will not give me the strength to do the thing that I have to do with a Kalashnikov or a book of spells, because I don't know what I'd do with those things if I had them. And if she was in the bathroom with me, I'd be dead, so the Kalashnikov wouldn't matter, and books of spells don't exist. Here is what I know. When you see the branches of the trees moving, you know they're near. Sometimes you get a glimpse of what they look like, just shadows really, with long hands and fingers, long enough that they could wrap one around your torso. The rest of them is the size of a chimpanzee. I've seen them a few times, but you only see them at the edges of your vision. When they're inside you, if you know something, then they know it too. And they're strong. Every Sunday at seven in the evening, mum goes and stands by the climbing frame for three minutes and I look at her through my telescope. I had to promise I wouldn't go and meet her. She said it's all right for me to know where she is, but the other way round is different. I don't see the difference myself. If I woke up with blood on my clothes and mum didn't show the next Sunday, how is that not as bad? But I always feel it, the excitement every week, like we're going to be able to speak to each other, like I could hug her, even though each time she comes she's putting herself in worse and worse danger. I don't look through the telescope a full half hour before seven. I don't want to know in which direction she comes from or where she'll be going back to. The trees are thick behind the playground. Michelle was the first of us to be visited. Eight years old and in her yellow dungarees with the webbed feet like a duck, when I found her in the front room with the television on, taking the rubbery bits out of our old cat Alice with a pair of kitchen scissors. Alice's head resting five or six feet away from her body and Michelle up to her elbows in blood. She held out a grasp of, a grasp of something to me with a smile that was not her own. And when I looked down, it was the mauve heart and it glistened. I only just got to the bedroom and locked the door bef before she was beating on it. My eight-year-old sister scared to walk on grass in case she squashed ants and her fists splintered the door frame. The trees move and through my telescope I can see some churches who try and live life in the old way, who are out enjoying the sun, who try to ignore them when they pass through looking for someone to visit, as if by closing their eyes they will be safe like their children and they don't understand anything. They say it's in the hands of God, a punishment against the unrighteous. Who knows if they're right? We discussed it as a family. Terry, mum's boyfriend, wanted to join. We need to stick together, he said. What's the point of being alive if you can't be with the people you love? There's safety in numbers. Mum had a rolled up tissue in her hand, but she wasn't crying. She was angry. I'm not going to sit and wait, I can't live like that. And I can't live alone, said Terry, and we'd all gone quiet. In the morning, when Terry had left, he shook my hand, and then he pulled me into him and sobbed. He grabbed hold of Michelle and hugged her too, smelled her hair. Mum didn't cry, Mum's eyes were only on the treetops. 
But when I watch the churches with my telescope from the 14th floor, even with their faces like they're cage diving with sharks, they are sure they are safe and yet. My telescope will skip a little to the side of a person and there will be the closeness of another body, the gloss of another person's hair hot in the sun. I never got the chance to have a girlfriend. The year it started, I'd just kissed Judy Cutler at a party, just rested my hand on her right breast for a few moments until she smiled and moved it away. I came home and found Michelle and Alice and then there was the curfew and Judy stayed inside until it all blew over. And then it all blew over us and everything was finished. It's seven and I look and mum's there like always. Thinner, of course. She gets thinner by the week. She stopped bringing Michelle a few months ago. This could be because now Michelle is old enough to be left alone. It could be Michelle has grown up quickly in the past year and understands the danger of living with someone you love. The alternative is not something I think about. Two years ago, it would have been neglect to leave a 10-year-old to fend for herself. But things are different now. Mum is in her old trench coat, even though it's hot out. She always looks cold. She crosses her arms and I focus on her mouth. I've learnt to lip read a little. She knows wherever I am I have my telescope. Who knows if she's saying the words out loud. I make out, I hope you're probably all right or eating well. And I'm fine. I make out the word Michelle. The bridge of mum's nose creases when she says it but I can't make out what she says afterwards, only that it is sad, which could mean anything or nothing at all. She stops speaking for a bit. Then she says, and what have you been up to, my lovely? And then mum does something that she's never done before. She holds her hand up and waves, and when she does it, she looks right into the telescope and she smiles like she knows where I am. The trees move above her, a flurry of leaves. It makes me start away from the eyepiece, only for a second, but when I look again, she is gone. I sit on my heels for just about five beats of my heart. Then I grab my backpack and throw my matches inside, three paperbacks, a jumper. There isn't time to fold down my telescope and I barrel out of the door. I am five floors down when I realize I've left my sleeping bag and my water bottle, but there isn't time to go back. Ten floors down, I duck into a utility cupboard. Mum has always been a good, a good runner. She used to win the parents, the parents' race at sports day every time. Through the cracked door in the cupboard, I see her flash by. They make full use of all of your limbs. They can twist in a different sort of a way. I try and think, realistically, what is so wrong with death? It's an end, isn't it? And isn't that what we're all waiting for in our separate rooms? Is it so important that it happens in 10 years' time rather than now? It was important last year because last year was the year we were still thinking it might all blow over. But now it's clear that it won't and we will just wait till someone slips up. It would be an end to the waiting and at least there'd be that final touch from another person. Thanks. Amy Wilde.